I've known Ken Peach for several years and we are very fortunate to have him as you'll see when I start to tell you a bit more about him. Ken is the Executive Director of the Health Council of East Central Florida, which is the health planning agency for Orlando and the Space Coast. The Health Council provides planning, program development, evaluation support that enables community-based health organizations to enhance population health. Before joining the Council in December of 2010, Ken owned a medical practice business, develop, uh, business development company, and that's when I met him, and, and also a health insurance agency. From 1985 to 2005, Ken was an administrator in hospitals, health systems, and senior living facilities. For two years, he served as the American Hospital Association Regional Executive for Florida and Puerto Rico, and Vice President, Integrated Delivery Systems with the Florida Hospital Association. Ken began his career in New Jersey and Florida, building, managing, and owning AM and FM radio stations. He has a BA in communications from Seton Hall University and an MBA with health services administration degree from Florida Institute of Technology. He is a fellow in the American College of Healthcare Executives. Ken and his wife Ann have three sons and they live right here in Orlando. You can see from Ken's resume that uh, when it comes to healthcare and senior services, Ken is a bit of a renaissance man what you might not see is that he is also a futurist, and I want to say that that's my claim, not Ken's, but I believe he is. Um, you've, heard the, you've heard it said many times that if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it. I think I also would say that when it comes to mapping out the future for seniors in our country, if we, if we want a future where we, that we would actually want to live in, we really should spend some time thinking about it today, and Ken does that. Uh, we've asked him to take a look into his crystal ball and give us a glimpse at what the future of senior living in Florida might look like. So would you please join me in giving a warm Altamont Springs uh, welcome to Mr. Ken Peach. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I want to start out. I'm not going to ask you for exercise because you've just been exercising wandering around the building. But I will ask you to raise your arm, okay, and make a fist. All right, no, we're not giving blood today, not a problem, okay? <laughs> Power to the people, because we are the people. If you look at the demographic statistics, by 2030, 72 million people in the U.S. older than age 65, okay? Twice the number in the year 2000 uh, that we had in 2000. In the 10-year period from 2010 to 2020, we're looking at a 36% increase in this aging population. So we are truly the future. And uh, to Don's point, it really didn't take too much work with a crystal ball to figure out where the demographics are going. The trick is, as I was sharing a few minutes ago outside, is that as we have this entire age wave coming toward us, at, or really that we're living through now, at the same time, we are experiencing severe drain on resources in, within the system to be able to help us uh, to go through this. As you know, lifespans are getting longer. Um, it's getting more and more difficult to figure out how are we gonna handle this going forward, growing demand and less resources to deal with it. Uh, Ken Dyschwall, you may know, he's researched the generations, and a lot of what I'm gonna share with you today is looking at generations. We're gonna go through three of the generations today and talk about what are the options, the living options, and where are things going for each of those. I also wanna share a 19% increase in the population over the age of 85 um, uh, also uh, facing from 5.5 million to 6.6 .6 million over age 85. So again, we've got a bright future forward toward us. What does it look like? What are some of the things that we're going to see? All right, many of you in here. Uh, how about show of hands, how many born between 1927 and 1945? All right, show of hands. All right, the great generation, right? The greatest generation. All right, now, called the traditionalist, okay, and also the greatest generation, you should be ages 68 through 86. Um, okay, show of hands again, how many of you are retired? Okay, great, vast majority, okay. We're gonna see a significant change in that when we talk about the next generation. But looking at that, um, I have uh, brought some prizes I thought they were going to be something that you could really use, but given how much is outside of some of the stands, this is probably kind of wimpy at this point. But okay, my question for you is in your generation, those of you who put up your hand in the greatest generation, 
what do you most value in your future? Okay? What do you most value? Security. Security. That happens to be the number one answer. So there we go. And I hope you're not diabetic. I don't want to. Okay. I was looking for sugar-free candy today, but I just couldn't do it. Even being head of the health council, I just thought, well, chocolate has some medicinal qualities to it. There you go. And I'm sticking to it. Okay. All right. So first of all, safety and security. And housing and financial resources have a significant play in that, obviously. Um, and the ability, again, that we, we look at planning forward and how is it that we manage our resources based on the longer lifespans that we are so often experiencing now. So that, that is certainly an issue, that safety and security and housing and financial. And we'll see that in the housing choices. And I'll just mention some of the housing choices that are certainly represented today by the organizations that you see in this building. The first one, assisted living. We have rental housing. We have support services. We have some basic health services and support for those individuals, what we call the ADLs, activities of daily living. So we have some support and some ability to assist individuals in their living process. Then we have congregate housing. Now that's independent, but supportive in the sense of, of basically coming together and sharing from a rental housing model. Uh, but there are ways, again, that we can share and support each other and be interactive. That socialization is so important. Um, I've had a chance to work in a community of close to 100,000 people now um, that is basically a 55 plus community. I, I worked in, and lived in Lake County. And you know, to experience uh, the opportunity to remain active and to remain active within the housing model is a tremendous benefit. So certainly assisted living, congregate housing, uh, continuing care retirement communities. They've had a real difficult time because if you look going back a few years ago when I was uh, operating and overseeing the operation of some nursing homes and assisted living facilities in this area back in the late 90s, one of the things we looked at from the standpoint of creating these age in place campuses was the fact that we looked to the uh, actuarial science and we said, okay, what is the lifespan? And now all of a sudden what's happening to the community, these CCRCs, continuing care retirement communities, is they made projections based on certain lifespan. And so what's happened now is individuals, as we're aging and living longer, uh, that throws that actuarial science out the window. So they've had a difficult time, but we do have continuing care retirement communities where you can basically uh, live in independent living and then move according to your particular health issues or needs into a more uh, supportive environment. Um, we also now have home health care. Um, we were talking before, uh, one of the booths, I was talking about the numbers of individuals that uh, as we grow this wave, how many different places can there be? And what we saw this morning in just the sponsor presentations a few minutes ago is there can be settings of very independent from apartments, you know, on through a variety of different settings uh, for, ind for independent living. But we're also, a lot of us want to stay at home as long as possible. So services delivered at home are going to be a significant uh, factor in this as well, as long as you can maintain that independence of living um, on your own. Now, independent living, here was a real eye-opener for me. Um, last year, my son, who's now moved to Gainesville, fortunately, because he brought my one-year-old granddaughter down, but our granddaughter was brand new. We had a chance to go to Philadelphia, where he was living at the time, uh, to spend some time with him at Christmas. His house was too small for us to stay there. So we made arrangements to stay at the Residence Inn, a Marriott property across from City Hall. Some of you may know it in Philadelphia. It's a high rise. It's probably 20 stories. And I checked in. It was two days before Christmas. And I said, OK, now, um, you know, this place is probably going to be empty. I said, no, no, you know, it's, it's a little quiet for visitors, but we have our regulars. I said, what do you mean by regulars? Well, we have our, our folks who live here. OK, back up for a moment. You live at the Residence Inn. Oh, yes, we have a population that's found that their caregivers and, and, and they themselves have chosen to basically live here at the Residence Inn. We have food delivered to the, the rooms. We have a daily breakfast. We have, uh, we have a social area on the second floor where people can interact. I had never thought of that. So talk about an end run on a population who wants to live independently and yet still have some level of support as a residence inn in downtown Philadelphia. So the funny thing is we have to look amongst ourselves. Is there anybody here that can identify that you're living in what might be an unusual situation, somewhere outside of your home and yet outside of some of the things we've talked about so far? If not, I'll share a few with you coming up. And in fact, we'll see if you can 
come up with some ideas on where you might live, at least if you're in the next generation as well. Uh, rental apartments or cottages. We saw the apartments this morning. That was a new one to me. Uh, the new apartments that are opening up 55 plus. Uh, again, completely independent um, housing and yet at the same time focused on the interest of those individuals 55 and above. Uh, then we've got nursing homes. Uh, some of you may end up there, some of you may end up there on a short basis. Uh, short term convalescence or recovery after a hospital stay. Um, I had a chance to uh, uh, operate or oversee operations on a couple of nursing homes again back in the 90s and we were really focused on um, taking those and making them unusual. In fact, we were working at the time, we didn't get it complete, but you heard I have a broadcast background. We were getting ready to put a low power radio station into the nursing home so that we could actually carry on, do newscast and old time radio shows and other things to engage people. We were putting a CB radio in so they could talk to the trucker traffic on Route 27 in Claremont from the nursing home. You know, the idea is we, we don't want to look necessarily at standard. How can we vary and make it different? And then you have special care units, assisted living for individuals with Alzheimer's disease uh, or related dementia. Uh, again, that's a population which unfortunately, as we see the aging population, we know will be an expanding population. There's not the day or the week that goes by that I don't read some new advance going on in, in the area of technology and new uh, breakthroughs, but still we have a lot to learn in terms of managing some of that. And so there will be that need for those special services as well. That's it on the greatest generation. I want to talk now about the biggest generation. Okay, shout it out. Who are the biggest generation that might be in this room? Baby, Baby boomers. All right, that's it. Okay, Baby boomers. Born 1946 to 1964. Uh, you know, a very long period of time. Okay, how many baby boomers do we have in the room? All right, quite a few of us. All right. Man, we are going to fight aging. We are fighting aging. It's an interesting uh, observation. Um, we're ages 49 through 67, so we're a real stretch. And for a long time, we kept talking about, well, in 20, what is it, 2011 or something, we're going to start turning 65. And that's happening now, but it's a completely different look at what retirement means. And that's what we're going to talk about next. So, stay out of our way. There, there are estimated between 7,000 and 10,000 of us turning age 65 on a daily basis now. So this, we don't talk about the age wave, 80 million roughly, uh, baby boomers, um, and a very rapid movement now into the retirement uh, years. Um, workaholics. Okay, I can't tell you how many people that I know that are all fellow baby boomers that have no intention of retiring. Okay, and this is what we're going to talk a little bit about today. So what are the options open to them other than retirement in the traditional sense? Um, very confident, confident that they're going to be healthy, that they're going to remain active. Okay, it's a, it's a confident, confident uh, group. Very independent and achievement oriented. And again, this is the national research I'm sharing with you from the book Age Wave and other similar studies that have been done. So we're very confident that we're going to tackle this aging thing going forward. Um, and very dedicated. Yes? Remember who taught you all that. Huh? Well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. That's why it was the greatest generation. Okay? You know, and really we had a very blessed, if you think 1946, end of World War II to 1964, that's why we all had you do the, uh, you know, the, the power fist before, um, you know, we had a very, very interesting variation in those years. Oh, okay, that's right, I don't need those. <laughs> uh, thank you, though. Um, we had a, a very interesting stretch, you know, and it's quite often I, I end up talking to people and they tell me, okay, uh, let's keep in mind, you know, you're the baby boomers, but you're by no means homogenous in those years. You have very, very distinct segments within that population. So when we talk about what we're discussing, we're sharing with you that these are, you know, obviously differences depending on where in that cycle you were, you were born. I mean, I think of that, uh, where was I recently? I was somewhere, I guess, downtown, and there was a gentleman with a beard that went down almost to his feet, you know, and, and a, a, you know, a bandana on. And I thought, he's a baby boomer like I am, but we are so different in terms of our politics and our interest and everything else. Um, and so there are great variations in that. Um, also, uh, tend to be very career focused as well. Uh, again, the idea that my career is going to keep going in some manner. I want to stay active and I want to keep engaged. Now Merrill Lynch did a study and I want to share with you a few things um, that they had uh, shared in here as well. Um, the first thing is that baby boomers will reinvent retirement. 
Okay, we're going to find a new way of, of doing retirement. We're going to reinvent it around what it is that we want. Um, and so what you're going to see is a whole new life stage because life um, extension or life expansion has occurred seven years since the 1930s. And remember what happened in the 1930s. Who can show me? In fact, we'll do a candy for this one as well. <laughs> All right. What happened in the 1930s? Some numbers were set. Big depression. Okay, true, right, 1929 and on into the 30s, but that's not what I'm looking for. Something passed, and it passed giving us an indication of when retirement would occur. Social Security, Social Security. all right, thank you. Social Security, okay, which originally was supposed to be a volunteer program that you put money in and you got that same money out. Now nobody today that's pulling Social Security is getting that same money uh, because of the government and you know, cross exchange and so forth. But the fact is they set the retirement age at 65 and do you remember what the age of expected lifespan was that, at that time? 65. Like 64, 65, 67 maybe? Right, exactly. And so that's why we're dealing today with looking at how are we going to extend Social Security because again we have fewer and fewer paying into it. Um, but that's how 65 became a retirement age. And the baby boomers don't look at 65 as a retirement age. They're looking at something more than that and longer than that. 76%, according to the research, are gonna keep working and earning to age 64. And then many will launch a new career or job at that point in time. There's a group called um, Aging Into Our Future that I'm involved in that we're meeting and looking at this issue. And we're looking at what are called gray jobs where the opportunity to extend employment opportunities as well for those that do wish to continue active or new business. I'm a retired, that sounds weird, SCORE, anybody that knows Service Corps of Retired Executives. I was the youngest SCORE counselor when I came in in my 40s um, and now I'm retired from SCORE. It just doesn't make much sense. But the point is with SCORE is I was working with small business people and I can't tell you how many were now coming in in their late 50s, early 60s and saying, you know what? I'm not going to be CEO of the company I'm in. I want to do something new. Help me create this new business. So we're going to see new business ideas blossom as individuals say, hey, I can do this. Now I have the wherewithal to do it. The kids are growing and we hope out of the house. So now is the opportunity to uh, go ahead and launch these. 65% plan to stop working for pay in their late 60s. So when I talk about SCORE, when we talk about RSVP, when we talk about a variety of other programs, they not, aren't necessarily looking for payment, but they continue to want to be active and work going forward. So we're going to see a lot of volunteer opportunities. Uh, in fact, I had, just to give you an idea, the hospital I was with out in Lake County had 400 volunteers, auxiliary members. Um, you know, it was an army, basically, to keep things uh, going. So others, though, prefer to reject full-time work or full-time leisure, and they want to do something in the middle. So they want to spend a certain amount of time, and anybody, uh, you probably wouldn't know the name, but Leland Kaiser spoke here probably 15 years ago at Church Street. And he was a healthcare futurist, and he said, you know what, there won't be retirement. There will be restructuring. There will be redesign in our lives. There won't be retirement as such. And where are we going with that? For a period of time, I may work, and then I'm going to want to take some time off to travel somewhere, learn something new. And then when I come back, um, OK, maybe I'm not ready to go back to work yet. So I'm going to go lifelong learning at UCF or one of the programs. I'm going to, I'm going to get engaged and learn something new in terms of a skill or a knowledge. And then maybe I'll go back to work. So you see in this population a movement toward an ongoing shifting amongst the options and things that you want to execute. Just to give you an idea, 42% cycle from work to leisure in this population. So almost half will go back and forth in terms of leisure and work. Now, there was a time a few years ago when I would have been able to tell you this and you would have said, well, sure, you know, they don't have to work, they can do the leisure. Now, work in many cases because of what's happened to retirement programs or the savings that we've had for retirement, having gone through this recession, we don't have that anymore, so work now may be more of a necessity than when this originally uh, was determined. 16% have some type of part-time work. 13% decide to start their own business. So that's that population that wants to go out there and do something new. 6% work part-time. 17% take full retirement. So again, we have a cross mix, and I don't want to speak and, and tell you everything's uniform, but we do have a mix of, of different approaches. 67% though, seek some type of mental stimulation. 
And that mental stimulation is that ongoing effort to learn more, to do more, to take on new skills, to learn how to do new things. So there is that constant. 37% must continue to earn. That's that population I was telling you that because of what's happened to our retirement savings, we've had to look for a different option. So there is that population that has that. Incidentally, this is the me to we generation. 43%, 10 times more likely that baby boomers are gonna put others first. Now that one, I'm sorry, but you did teach us well, okay? As the greatest generation, you passed those lessons down um, that we really needed to do for others. So it's really nice to see, and that of course contributes to this, okay, I don't need a paycheck now, but I really would like to stay engaged and serve others. So that's a, a great sign. Anybody here know Walt Willis? Walt runs a food program that delivers pounds and pounds of food in Seminole County every month. And you know, here's a, a, a guy who's retired from neighborhood services in the past and who now has basically a new career in doing this food delivery up in Seminole County. So there's a great example again of somebody engaged and not doing it for dollars, but doing it because of a love of doing it. Um, now, 48% or three times are more worried than the previous generation about the impact of a major illness. And that's the wild card. How do we protect ourselves against a major illness and the impact of that? And so that's the greatest concern about going forward for baby boomers is the need to stay healthy and again, stay engaged. 53% worry about the ability to pay for that care if they have a major illness. 48% worry about ending up reliant on full-time nursing. So the desire is again, let me use the resources that are available to keep me healthy and active and well and engaged in things. Um, here, there's a difference. Women and the baby boomers, according to the research, are concerned about or are interested in better education, seeking personal growth. So that's where you'll see women going out to the education, the continuing education resources that are available in the community, seeking career development, okay, and also seeking community involvement. So you've got women in the baby boomer generation that want to stay active and engaged. All right, anybody want to guess what the men are indicating in this survey they want to do? Leisure. <laughs> Leisure, that's it. Okay, work less and relax more. All right, that sounds good to me, but as you know. Um, so there is a difference, and that's going to play out very interesting too. Uh, in fact, again, having worked in an area of retirement, um, we found that recruiting nurses from the area population was not at all difficult because they wanted to be engaged in work and the husbands wanted to spend the day on the golf course. Um, so, you know, it was a great uh, opportunity to recruit uh, good talent. So, new housing operations for baby boomers, okay? Here's uh, some exciting and really interesting changes. All right, first of all, cogeneration. What's cogeneration housing? Anybody want to hazard a guess at that? Kids, did I hear kids? Yeah, exactly. Now, is that one by choice? Not necessarily, okay? Not necessarily. What we're seeing is because of the economy, I mean, I work a lot with UCF students and I see them coming to the end of their undergraduate program and immediately going into a master's program. I tell them don't do it because they're not ready, particularly in a business major. Uh, they're not ready to do it. They don't, don't have the life skills and experience to apply, but unfortunately, most of them don't have any other option. And likewise, when it comes down to living options, many of them end up moving back in with baby boomer parents. So we are going to see co-generation living, whether or not we like that. The next area is home monitoring. Okay, um, I worked a few years ago with Johns Hopkins on a program called Hospital at Home, which basically, and this is for individuals that otherwise would be in the hospital or were able to get out sooner, and be provided with care with a high acuity home care service, keeping them at home. But even related to that are services now that use electronic devices to monitor individuals in their home. So you can be home and be independent at the same time, have the ability, and I'm not talking necessarily just about what we call PERS, personal emergency response systems. I'm also talking about motion sensors, video, and communication. I'm working right now with a company that is putting into every cell phone, and I have to pre preface this by sharing with you that this is your option to use it. Okay, but Qualcomm manufactures chips in their phones and effective almost immediately, every smartphone that they generate has a chip that allows me to put a blood sugar sensor on you 
that allows me to take uh, heart sensors and other things, just little devices they won't see you wear under a shirt or, or uh, on your arm, okay, that communicates every few seconds by Bluetooth with your smartphone. And if you've told your, your physician has told you, okay, your blood sugar has to be in this range, as soon as your smartphone communicates regularly out and says you're out of that range, your phone rings and it's going to be your caregiver, your doctor's practice calling you to tell you that you need to do this to adjust your blood sugar. All right, there is nothing. I can show you. This is e-triage on this unit right here. I can tell you what's wrong with me in a matter of minutes based on my symptoms, what I have to do, how quickly I have to get it addressed. So a lot of technology, and we're seeing that now moving into the home as well. Now, again, those can be very invasive, and that's the, if you look at it that way, but more baby boomers are saying, wait, I'd rather preserve my independence. Give me those technical technologies that allow me to live and remain as independent as possible. Uh, here's another one. How many of you are familiar with alumni housing? Alumni housing. Anybody graduates here, University of Florida? Okay, couple, all right. They have alumni housing. I don't know whether you knew that or not, but they, what's happening now is, remember, the baby boomers want to learn. So what better place to go than to have a home near Rollins College, near UCF, near one of the universities where you can engage in that constant learning. And what they're doing now is some of the universities are saying, okay, we've got a lot of alumni out there. They contribute and support, I think, in giving church is number one and I think education is number two. So give to education, live in this housing, you're contributing to your university on an ongoing basis, and lo and behold, you're living where you can continue to learn and be active. So alumni housing. How about anybody familiar with, um, I want to make sure I get it right, Neighbors Network. Neighbors Network. It's just starting up in Winter Park. Um, and Neighbors Network is a program that will, again, provide you the ability to live independently and have services, vetted services, delivered to you and to your home. This is, a, it's called the village concept. It has nothing to do with the villages in Lake County. This actually started up in Boston, Washington, and now it's available here as well in select communities. So again, it's a support mechanism for baby boomers who choose to use that. And there's no limit on baby boomers. For those of you in the greatest generation as well, this is again another way that you can remain independent uh, you know, and look at different options that you have. All right, international. Some of you may have realized that people that you knew suddenly have moved to where? Costa Rica, Belize. There are some that just choose to go overseas. The dollar goes a lot further there. So we also see now a movement toward the potential for international living in our retirement years. Uh, Timeshares. I have a Marriott timeshare, um, and I found it interesting. We, uh, we were up at uh, Myrtle Beach last year, and I was talking to the, one of the sales reps. He said, yeah, I've got somebody now that has nine months of timeshare in Marriott. And so what they do is they just travel wherever. He invented something so he could afford to do that. But uh, he basically just travels whatever resort he wants at that time, and most of the year he spends in timeshares. Um, so they, I told you there were going to be some rather innovative approaches here. Here's another one. Anybody, here f anybody else here from New Jersey? Grew up in New Jersey. All right. Anywhere near Scotch Plains, New Jersey? No. Okay. Scotch Plains, New Jersey, if you go back up there now, I'm sure it's still there, has Snuffy's Steakhouse. Snuffy Robinson, who built that uh, back in the 1950s and then grew it to a great enterprise, was featured here in the Orlando Sentinel years ago when he had retired to Florida. And where do you think he was spending his retirement? cruise ships. Week after week, month after month, he basically lived at sea on cruises. Okay? So I, I shared with you today, I would come up with some bizarre and innovative ways to retire. I don't know, you know, if you don't get seasick, that might be a possibility for you as well. How many of you have heard about greenhouse? Other than the ones that grow plants, okay? There's a greenhouse project. That uses a shared kitchen, some common areas, and allows individuals to live and support each other together. Okay, so there's another one. Uh, granny pods. Anybody familiar with granny pods? You, how many of you are familiar with pods, the modular units? Granny pod is pretty much the same thing. A modular unit that can be attached or put on a lot, zoning provided, uh, if zoning approves this, can literally be located and you can live in that pod and adjacent to the family home. So that's something else that's being looked at in addition to the traditional adding on to the family home for a uniform uh, family group. The key here, I think, in anything and in the many retirement options that are represented here today is the ability also of what are the site options for where you are. So are you close enough to be able to get out and walk and exercise? Do you have parks 
uh, and, and perhaps walking trails. There's a new trail open in New Jersey that runs on the Jersey Shore, old railroad route, um, that runs through four or five towns. I went up there a few months ago and was bike riding, and everybody passing me were retirees, and all of the um, Leisure Village and Greenbrier and other communities are now building along this walking trail. So it's a great opportunity if you can find something nearby where you can get out and walk, and also any nearby water. We're just attracted to water, so it's nice to have lakes. Or, and that's one of the beauties here, and so many of our retirement communities have some type of water feature nearby. So. The next generation, anybody here from age 33 to 48? Okay, oh, I got one, all right, a couple? I got a couple, all right, Generation X. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on them today because uh, I'm, unless we've got a few minutes, I don't wanna uh, draw you. But born 1965 through 1980. Now, uh, Don's challenge to me was look at retirement going forward. So um, I'll just mention a few things because their retirement will be completely different than the baby boomers and the greatest generation. Age 33 to 48, 60% um, attended college. When you look back to the greatest generation, I mean, that's, again, something that you did, you know, enabling that and, and that we baby boomers are now enabling that uh, college. They're independent, resourceful, self-sufficient. They understand no lifetime employment by any individual company, so they gotta make it on their own. So they're very flexible in terms of changing jobs and what have you. They will work to live rather than live to work. Okay, so there's a flip there from the baby boomers who want to continue working and stay active. And in this case, I live because I, I work because I want to live. So it's a little bit different focus than, uh, than what we have. Work hard, play hard. Housing options, they're in a digital world. So they're gonna look much more at digital delivery of services. Um, and the ability, as so many of us now have, to reach out and use the internet to connect with services and security. Um, and this is also a generation that's focusing on urban living. We see more and more, three sons, all three of them went to school outside the state of Florida, even though I had them prepaid in the state of Florida. But all three of them, two of the ones now, one still at college, the other two, one living in downtown um, uh, Washington, D.C. The other one was living in downtown um, Philadelphia until he went back to school for his doctorate. So, um, and they probably will end up going back to urban living. So we're going to see a great movement now and an expansion in the size of our cities as a result of this. So a bright future to sum up today, just some of the things that we've talked about. Retirement is becoming redesign and redirection and restructuring your life. Working, learning, and playing part-time. Housing and options in Florida will have to support this redesign or restructuring. You're gonna see them located near work opportunities. So there are places nearby where you can go to work and get employment. You're gonna see them include a home office. If I'm running my own business, do I need to be outside of my home anymore? Probably not. So you may very well see an interest in expanding or using space. We have two friends that are retired up in Lake County, um, no kids, and two of their three bedrooms in their house are offices. He's got one or she's got one and they just operate out of their office. And she has an international consulting practice. Uh, online education or nearby learning, college or university, tremendous increase in the amount of education available to us online. Outdoor and indoor amenities allowing for year-round sports and recreation. Libraries now becoming resource centers. Have you noticed that it doesn't seem like they're pushing books off the shelves anymore? More and more of it is computer. But we do have libraries that are becoming resource centers to us. And many of the retirement communities here have some sort of library on site as well. We were just talking about that in the, the apartments. Um, so, okay, and one day in extended trips. That was a big area. I uh, oversaw the operation of 55 plus, the uh, retirement program for Orlando Health for a number of years, and amazing. I mean, we were sending people all over the world, New Zealand and Europe and everything else. Great deal of interest in travel. So challenges, affordability, that we talked about. It's gonna be difficult going forward to stretch your dollars. Life's getting longer, and again, the government's having its own issues with trying to, to uh, pay for things. Um, and then the supply for the growing demand. As we do have that huge wave, looking for places that are right for you may be more difficult because of the supply issue. Now, I'll finish with just a few bumper snickers as you enjoy your senior living options day, okay? Three things to keep in mind. I saw these on the uh, back of some cars recently. The first one says, I asked my wife if old men wear boxers or briefs. She answered, depends. <laughs> That snap, crackle, and pop in the morning, that wasn't your Rice Krispies. <laughs> Sometimes I wake up grumpy. 
Sometimes I let them sleep. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>